Chess.com's coverage of the 2019 FIDE World Cup got underway today with round one. Of course, we have news reports and live coverage with our partners, the Chess Bras, covering everything that is going down in Conti Monsisk. But I'm also going to be scouring the games played and try to pick one of my favorites each day if I can to bring you a video highlight of what went down. So here today in round one, I chose the game between Sean Press as white versus Dingley Wren as black. Let's dive in and see why I chose this one. Obviously a Sicilian, right? Has to be an opening that I've played for many, many years of my life. But jokes aside, the close Sicilian, not something you see played against the world's elite guys like D Ren Dingley Wren that often, uh, at least not outside of Rapid and Blitz. But Sean Press goes for this, and then with a typical g3, knight c6, bishop g2, we're in a very, very common close Sicilian uh, that you can find information about pretty much anywhere you want to look up and use opening databases. Uh, g6, d3, bishop g7, and now on bishop e3, we see Dingley Wren choose the move that I would say, as somebody who played this my entire chess career, that the move rook to b8 really kind of won the battle really in the late 90s, the early part of the turn of the century, as, as kind of the most principled, very very popular way that the best players in the world chose to play this uh, this position. Before that, the move 6, knight d4 was also very common. Of course, pushing e6 or e5 and even knight f6 are all theoretically sound moves here. But rook to b8 is a very principled approach. In, in every Sicilian, you're looking for your rook and bishop to work together on the queen side. Whether that's a dragon sacrifice, you know, on c3, or things with the rook on the b file and the pressure that this bishop exerts, eventually causing some discomfort for white. This is just a very principled thing for black to do. And in a closed Sicilian, where you don't have white doing the normal things of, of opening up the structure, which is the difference between an open and a closed Sicilian, right? It makes even more sense that black can be ultra aggressive on the queen side and launch their plan. So that's what black does here with rook b8 and b5. Note that there's there's no discoveries here on an undefended knight on c6, so don't, don't get too frisky on me. If you try to push this pawn, black will pretty much always just capture with the knight and save the piece in the process. So instead we have knight gd2, and after the very common b4, as we said, black is being very aggressive and principled. Knight to d1 is met by a move that, although this is not the first novelty in the position, this was the first moment where me analyzing the game myself, someone who's played these positions a lot, started just kind of taking notes of what Ding Lee Ren was up to. He played the move h5. Now, this is not just a bullet approach on chess.com, right? He's not just trying to play h4 and h3, which, by the way, he kind of is. If, if white does something of unconsequence here, you might see h4. And, and try to open the h-file, you might even see h3 because it does cause some weird things. You can imagine if the pawn gets to h3 and the bishop has to move, then the knight comes into d4, e5, maybe hitting that bishop. So there actually are some really aggressive plans with Harry the h-pawn here, but that's not really the idea. H, h5 is played so that you actually stop white's plan of eliminating your best piece. Now, what's an example line I can give with that? Well, if you play the move knight f6, for example, instead in these Sicilians, White will play bishop h6 and immediately try to make, make you part ways with your favorite minor piece on the king side. And e even if those positions aren't the end of the world, it's, it's not ideal for black and it's certainly not a dynamic way for black to be playing for a win. So h5 is played in many ways to stop that idea in addition to maybe the threats you have. White plays h3, and this is the way you've stopped h4, is because what Press is saying here is if you play h4 now, now I can respond with g4. Um, obviously, without a move like h3, g4 is not a possibility because you'll just lose the pawn, right? So h3 is played to protect the pawn. h4 would be met with g4, and that would actually be a very good thing for white. There's no way you want that as black because white's going to get f4 and have this very, very nice kind of big pawn, big pawn opportunity here on the king side. A pawn storm is coming. Uh, so instead, after h3, now we get our first actual novelty. Dingley Ren played the move e6, and when I, I said novelty kind of anticlimactically there because it wasn't necessarily a groundbreaking idea. Uh, knight f6 is the more typical move here. Um, the, the game I saw played by maybe the most strongest, most recognizable player to the chess community these days was uh, a game where Alexei Serrana, the young man from Russia who played in our own junior speech chess championship, won a nice game as black uh, with the move knight f6. But, but this move very obviously blocks your bishop and it's it's often not your favorite square for the piece in these close Sicilians. If you have your way, the reason e6 is, is the favorite of a lot of people who play these positions as black is because it's by far the most flexible move, right? It, it doesn't relinquish your control over the central light squares. It doesn't block your bishop on g7, like a move like knight f6, or even another move that's been played in this position, e5 would, right? Blocking the bishop. It also overprotects against White's only real eventual attacking idea on the close Sicilian, which, to, which is to eventually play f4 and f5. 
And so E6 is, is almost always the preferred choice if you have the opportunity to do it, because it's the most flexible thing you can do as black, uh, for all those reasons I just listed. So Dingley Ren played E6, and after castles, knight G E7, F4, we get A5. Again, just very disciplined right now. You're going to continue to do what you would normally do on the queen side, which is gain space and then know how to use it, right? And after rook b1 castles, we, we got a tough moment where white played the move g4. And as a former professional chess coach, here to admit that, I, I taught lessons for many, many years in and out of people's homes. And I would often tell students in these types of positions to be very careful when you push that g pawn in front of your king because it's a pawn that can't go back and it instantly changes things. Uh, Dingley Ren did the response here that every Sicilian player needs to make note of and put it in their pocket. I'm going to show that in a second. Um, but it's, it's most effective even, meaning the move Dingley Ren did that I'm about to show, because white played g4. Uh, very often, I would advise students in the way you would want to play these positions is don't push this pawn until you're sure you can really execute on something on the king side. From that perspective and analyzing with an engine, I actually would have preferred knight f2 and even a, a slower approach. Bishop f3, try to put the king on h2. Sometimes white can even try to play c3 before this knight comes into d4. So, uh, you know, if black does something, bishop d7, bishop a6 are both moves. Sometimes black goes out of, out of, sorry, white goes out of the way just to control the center and really make sure that once you eventually do get this move, you can bring everybody with gusto to this side of the board to try to keep the attack going. So it's, it's hard for me to criticize g4 on a principled level. It's very common for white in the close Sicilian. But Dingley Ren from here on out really puts on a clinic that you should make note of, not just as a Sicilian player's black, but anytime you're playing positions with a black fiend, oh, sorry, a, a kingside fiend keto. Uh, it doesn't have to apply just to black's position. It can also work for white. But the idea is you, you, you put the kibosh on the pawn storm right after the g pawn is pushed with the move f5. Now, why is this so key? Well, the first thing is that it cinches this pawn on f4 so that this bishop on e3 is now a Franken pawn, uh, forever stuck looking at the, at the rear of this pawn on f4. So you immediately say that this battery that white works so hard to build will never see the light of day again. Uh, you also are inviting white's position to become more and more open. By playing f5, you're saying, you played g4, and now you can't take it back. I want to open up everything here, because I actually think your king is going to be weaker than my king when all is said and done. Um, so again, another key reason why you do this. Plus, the pressure it puts on white is actually going to force white to exchange, which is going to help black complete his development as well, which happens in a lot of these close Sicilians, just like it did here. Um, Takes, takes. By the way, note that I, I did analyze this for a blog. You can, you can follow me on chess.com. I, I write blogs over there pretty much anytime I do a video. I try to give you guys the detailed written analysis that I've been doing here for the last hour and a half. And I also noted that once again, I think knight f2 was probably the best move for white. One fun line to show for, for white is you would never want to take here as black and try to get a discovery because here come the attacking ideas with f5. Uh, sacrificing the pawn, but just blowing things open, something like this to just get the attack on the king, really shows you how you could get in trouble here as black, right? So those are the things that close Sicilian and Grand Prix attack players fantasize about, right? Weird fantasies to have, I know, but that's what they fantasize about. Um, but that that's not really going to be what would happen if knight f2. Probably Dingley Ren plays a move like knight d4 was what I analyzed would have been best to to return the favor of maintaining the tension by maintaining the tension yourself. Um, but okay, so f5, I, I still think white should have played knight f2 rather than taking and closing, because now this is really a great example of what I already kind of foreshadowed. White's king is going to be more open than black's. You've put the kibosh on this battery. All of white's dark squares are only temporarily guarded because there's pieces, but if you start imagining these pieces coming off the board, look who's a sitting duck over here, right? So that kind of foreshadows what Dingley Ren did here. Bishop e6, a natural developing move that gains a tempo. Knight d5, a natural way to grab the center. I also analyzed in my blog that I think bishop d5 would have been kind of interesting. But knight d5, bishop f2, and here's where it gets fun. Knight to d4, the most principled thing to do in these close Sicilians. You have a center square, use it. Even at the risk of double pawns, these pawns are so incredibly useful. They, they're, they're strangling white's options on the dark squares. Uh, the d pawn itself is, is not a targetable weakness and actually also helps control the center. So you can already get the feeling that this looks like a great position for black, especially with squares like e3 and c3 calling the name of that knight on d5. Rook e1 was played, bishop f7, and after knight b2, I, I really like Dingley Ren's move here. I gave it an x glam because it shows that it's not just how optically good a square looks, and even the potential you might have to grab some material, but one thing you have to consider whenever a trade's going to happen is, do you get more squares available to your pieces after the trade, or does your opponent? 
And if the answer is you, very often that's a trade you should prioritize and start calculating. And the move that was played here, 93, not only does that, because any trade here is going to open up devastating dark square bishop problems, but it also points out that the, the material itself is really not relevant for black, right? This doubled pawn did its purpose to, to grip the dark squares and now force white to part with kind of his most important defensive piece. Um, so much so that, I don't know, if I was playing white, I might have sacked the exchange just to keep that bishop on the board, even if I'm worse. Uh, but Press apparently wasn't afraid of his dark square problems. And uh, after queen takes rook e8, queen f2, he may have wanted to change his mind. Rook takes e1, obviously rook takes e1 would have lost a piece, just a forcing line. So queen takes e1 is played, and a lot of people could play this position now for black. Look how much fun this is going to be. Queen b6 check, the dark squares are about to get surgical up in this, right? Just so many squares, too, not enough time for white. King h2, rook e8 with tempo, queen f1. Now, if, if you look at this game with an engine, and I, I did put some lines into the blog, uh, black, for example, could take here, play queen e3, and then and then execute a second rank attack where probably every single Peshka falls. But why? Get, how could you ever give up a bishop like that, right? So I don't, I don't care what the engine says. I think d5 is a brilliant move by Dingley Wren. Again, it strangles the only potentially active square for the white knight on b2. Just awesome. And, and so this knight going to a4, not, not a fun way to, to improve your knight. Queen d4, king h1. And now I'm going to let you pause the video. I'm going to try to do this in every game at least once to try to guess black's move if you want. Uh, really a great example of just full board awareness, recognizing your opponent's weaknesses. And we've already been foreshadowing the weak dark squares, the weak king, but then not missing an opportunity to take advantage of it, even if optically it's a little strange, right, to make a retreating move. And that move is bishop f8, exclam. Not only is it a retreat of the bishop to come to new diagonals that hurt things, but you know what that bishop just did? It just got out of the way of the first lady. She's coming to h8 to use the h file against the king. Just awesome. Rook c1 was played, bishop d6, uh, I think queen h8, as, as strange as it seems to go back to g7, followed by bishop d4, was actually the fastest way for Dingley Ren to win. There, in fact, there's, there's like literally no way to stop bishop d4 here. There's no way to deal with bishop d4, and just everything is falling here. Uh, so that was probably the fastest, but uh, playing bishop d6 to win f4 makes sense. c3 takes, knight takes, the f4 pawn fell, and after rook c2, queen h8 check, uh, White didn't resign. I think he actually played King G1 um, and then resigned after having made his own move. Uh, but there's several ways to mate. I think the most clear is something like Bishop H2 and then Queen H4 and Queen G3, noting that Bishop H2, if King H1, I think you have Bishop G3, opening up both Queen H2 and Rook E1 winning the Queen. So that would have been uh, a fun way for things to end. But as we said, uh, White... Pretty much resigned, I think, right after playing King G1 himself. So, uh, just an awesome game. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Definitely my favorite win by one of the world's elite here in the first round of the FIDE World Cup. Uh, while I have your attention, let me remind you that you can check out all the news and action, all the reports that we're going to be bringing to you uh, from Conti Monsisk. Just go to chess.com slash news. We will have full coverage of this event, one of the most exciting events because it's truly a knockout that eventually decides a champion. Uh, and who's covering it live? Well, our partners are the Chess Bras. They have Yasser as their guest, so that's pretty exciting. They're up early. We know it's hard for those guys. They don't really have a bedtime, but uh, they don't really wake up that happily either. But I hear their show is going well regardless, um, and uh, we hope you check them out. So thanks for tuning in. Um, give, us, give us a like, if you will. Give us a subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, get at me on Twitter if you have any questions, and we will see you around on Chess.com.